Nigerian economy most stable in Africa with 3.2 percent, 3 percent growth projection for 2023 and 2024. China, World Bank exploring solutions to debt distress deadlock. And House commences investigation into alleged loss of $2.4 billion revenue. Plus, oil edges up as a market awaits key U.S. inflation data. Details of these and more on Business Express on the network service of the NTA. And we are reaching you from Abuja, the nation's capital. I am Benny Adams, your guide. to have you join us at this time is our time we talk business i will start by telling you that china and world bank are exploring compromises over how to restructure billions of dollars of debt held by poor nations seeking a long sought breakthrough that could unlock desperately needed aid Discussions on Wednesday in Washington during World Bank and International Monetary Fund spring meetings are aimed at ending a deadlock among the world's biggest creditor nations on how to renegotiate several poorer nations' debt, which had become unsustainable amid surging inflation and a stronger dollar. And despite uncertainties in the global economy, coupled with inflationary pressure being experienced in Nigeria, Africa's largest economy, has maintained a stable economic performance in recent times. The Division Chief Research Department, IMF, Daniel Lee, stated this during a briefing at World Economic Outlook meeting. Abolade Salami in Washington, D.C. has the details. Nigeria's economic recovery in 2022 financial year broadened despite contraction of oil production, increasing inflation figures, and lingering external sector pressures. The country was able to weather the storm through its monetary and fiscal policy decisions, which resulted in stable economic progression. In order for the country to tackle issues of inflationary pressure, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, has suggested further tightening of monetary policy. Uh, for Nigeria, our forecast is one of the most stable ones uh, for this year. We have an increase, a slight increase. Of, uh, we have 3.3% in 2022. That's an upward revision. And uh, for 2023, about the same, 3.23% uh, in 2024. On the broader projection of the continent's economic outlook, IMF Chief Economist and Director of Research, Pierre Olivia says the region is expected to experience a slow growth of about 3.6 percent in the year 2023. A very important challenge for the region is uh, uh, as a result of these uh, elevated food prices, we have a, a large number of people who are in situations of food insecurities. We estimate about uh, something like 130 million people in situation of food insecurity. IMF says challenges confronting the region revolve around the surge in energy and food prices, one of the many consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. From Washington, D.C., Abolade Salami. 
Still from stories from the District of Columbia, we have the economic growth rate the world over is expected to fall to 2.8% in 2023 before rising slowly to settle at 3.0% in five years. This is part of the baseline forecast of the International Monetary Fund, released on Tuesday at its ongoing spring meetings in Washington, D.C. Muplang Dakog reports that this is the lowest medium-term forecast in decades. The Managing Director of International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, said with the inflationary pressure, recovery has been elusive, thereby resulting in central banks' continuous increase in interest rates to control the trend. The transition from abundant liquidity with low interest rates to lower liquidity and higher interest rates, she added, has exposed vulnerabilities in the financial sector, thereby making task of policy making harder. Is despite the remarkable resilience of consumer spending in the United States, in Europe, despite the uplift from China's reopening, global growth would remain below 3% as we projected it earlier this year. And what is more concerning, it would remain around 3% for the next five years. In building resilience and shaping development, World Bank Group President David Malpass says the bank is keen on paying attention on performance of the world economy, the debt problems facing developing countries, with a view to provide assistance to people around the world, and especially for people that are on the lower end of the income scale in developing countries, as well as advanced economies that are suffering from the lower incomes. As, as we look at it, the, the uh, elements of growth into the future, uh, it's important that there be more investment, uh, investment in small businesses, in, uh, uh, in new businesses, uh, and that means a flow of capital. And a worry that we have for developing countries is the capital inflow, the capital flow right now is out of developing countries. So there's, for many of the developing countries, it looks like they're in a phase of decapitalization mm -hmm. rather than recapitalization. Uh, international Monetary Fund, in its research says cost of trade fragmentation can run as a 7% of global GDP over the years. Okay, that was uh, Bola de Salami still giving us update on ongoing events at the spring meeting. And now to the meat of the matter. That is our conversation. The International Monetary Fund IMF and the World Bank spring meetings enter the third day and issues of inflation, cost of living, climate change, debt and slow economic growth continue to dominate the conversations at the global event. To talk more on these issues, I have joining me from Yenagua, by a state development analyst, Ifani Chuku Ukoha. Glad to have you join us on Business Express. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Good. Uh, let's start with um, the Nigerian economy is the most stable in Africa. From that report, we got to here uh, with like 3.2 percent and 3 percent growth projection for 2023 and 2024. That is according to the IMF. That is cheering, if you agree with me. But I'll ask, were you expecting this? Well, yes, I, I, I was expecting it because as the world begins to experience more uncertainty, um, environments, environments like Nigeria. Nigeria already is bedeviled with uncertainty. So the irony is that they are trying to learn what we have already known. I mean, we see people learning how to use generator in Europe with these power problems and um, uh, foil queues and all that. These are things that were used to in Nigeria. So um, I expect that they would have looked at the fact that we had peaceful uh, transition. Our elections went smoothly. Um, we are tackling our security problems. And so on. So some of these things have made us to look stable. But for me, the bigger question is, are we where we should be? Because when they are saying this, they are comparing this growth to, to last year, because growth is usually um, comparative. And the bigger question is, when we lost as Africa, as Nigerians, have our own summits of heads of state to be able to plan our economies. I mean, there are really some things that we need to uh, get, get in shape, like to work on like the flooding situations and things like that. We had a bad flood last year. What are we doing to prevent that and increase productivity? Things like power. We have oil, we have uh, gas and everything. So I believe that Nigeria should be far ahead of where we are. But it's a good thing that they recognize that we're still 
and it's a very chaotic world environment right now. Okay, that is to say we're not where we are supposed to be, but we're actually moving, we're advancing. And more so with yes. the increase of our production and the peace, relative peace we're experiencing in Niger Delta, which is an, an addendum from what you've said. Well, clearly, again, uh, there are issues of high inflation, uh, cost of living, and uh, supply chain disruption. When you look at it, monetary authorities have continued to raise the, the rates, talking about um, uh, lending rates to curtail inflation. What does fiscal, what do you think the fiscal authorities should do to, to address all these issues and to complement decisions that are being taken from the monetary policy end? Yes, um, I think that, I mean, they work hand in hand. Monetary policy has its part. Uh, luckily, we're coming into a new administration. Uh, the budget, uh, most of our budgets have been extended to start from June. So there's a great opportunity here for us to use a uh, fiscal policy um, to, to enhance monetary policy. But for that to work, we have to increase productive base. And the way to increase productive base is to ensure that the current situation is good and the power situation is good and there are good incentives that are properly targeted to the right sectors of the, in the, in the, of the economy, like agriculture, like manufacturing, and you know this would then complement the um, inflation uh, fight, the monetary policy fight of CPM. That I mean, people will be able to have um, expenditure. People have liquidity, able to afford goods and services. Okay, good. Then looking at um, the issue of debt, that is one of the issues on the table. Already, China and the World Bank are exploring solutions to debt distress deadlock. What should Nigeria be expecting from this? From recent reports, we are seeing Nigeria is meeting her, her debt obligation. Then, but then, that doesn't stop us from, from borrowing. But with this being put on the table uh, at the spring meetings, what should we expect from that? So um, Nigeria becomes a beneficiary in this regard because um, when they are talking about the debt crisis, China is probably worried about people owing them, which includes Nigeria, and we are worried about the, the level of debt that we have. So uh, I think that um, what we need to do is to show uh, our capacity. I mean, we are able to pay our debts, but in terms of utilization, putting the debt into the right place, borrowing for the right reasons, you know, for developing infrastructure and so on. So I see these discussions as uh, possibly beneficial for countries like Nigeria that are heavily in that. Okay. Looking at issues of financing a budget, which is a year in, year out thing, do you think the plan of removal of subsidy will put Nigeria in a better position? So um, the issue of subsidy, I think that it would actually, the plan of removal will put us in a better position. Do I say um, already? Most of the goods are transported by diesel. Most of the big buses use diesel. Most of the big trucks use diesel. Diesel has been deregulated for years. Now, the problem is that when we are subsidizing petrol, we're not really subsidizing production and the forest. So I feel like time for us to remove this elephant in the room so that the room can have more air and we can breathe. Um, subsidy has been an issue that has um, encouraged a lot of corruption in the system. So I'm out for me personally. So that we should remove subsidy and instead try and improve the productivity and liquidity in the system for be able to afford uh, to live a better life. Okay, obviously, again, uh, from the Ukraine-Russia war, uncertainties, uh, climate change, are the issues at, at the spring meetings. So what do you think Nigeria and other African uh, countries uh, need to do at this point in time to build resilience? And more so, more so, when the Russia-Ukraine uh, issue came up, we, we had opportunity to fill in the, the energy that has been, uh, energy shortage that has been experienced. Do you think uh, that opportunity shouldn't be missed again? Yeah, so you see, um, the, uh, the, there's, a, there's an, a Chinese word that says the worst crisis is also opportunity. So as the time goes up, it goes down. I see a lot of interesting things happening in the world. There's a struggle for power. So you find the Chinese, uh, the Russians forming a block, currency block. And you find people like the French trying to say, look, America, you can't force us to be with you. We should be able to decide where we want to go. So it's a good time. Everybody is struggling to be the, uh, the, the better group for the brides. And then... Um, uh, I see that there are opportunities for Nigeria as long as we go forward with the interest of the people at heart. You know, because also these people are very good at uh, manipulating corruption. 
in terms of trying to get their interest done. Wow, that's great. Thank you very much, Mr. Ifai Okoha, for sharing your thoughts with us at this particular point in time. We'd we'll we'll love to connect with you again to get to discuss issues at the spring meetings. Thank you very much. But in part, I would like to say that Africans should also form their own spring meetings. It may not be spring, I mean, before the planting season or whatever, so we can decide our own future. These guys are productive in summer, and that's why they're meeting in spring. So we should think about something local, Nigerian or African. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much on that parting note. Well, Gumbi is home to one of the biggest dams that has potential to turn around the nation's economic fortunes if properly harnessed. Nafisa Umar Garba examines the irrigation component of the dam and how it has been contributing to Nigeria's food security. Dad in Kowa Dam, the second largest in Nigeria, is located about 37 kilometers from Gombe. The dam generates 34 metric words hydroelectricity and provide 44,000 hectares of land for irrigation purposes. Year in, year out, farmers cultivate hundreds of assorted foods and cash crops, particularly rice, maize, wheat, fruit, and vegetable, to secure the nation's food security and provide job opportunities. Farmers are so much enjoying and the economy is so much improving. Before, before the irrigation system, Farmers, uh, in fact, uh, I will say they are very much poor. The economy of the country is moving forward in terms of irrigation farming activities. The Dhaninkowa irrigation site is less busy this year because of the ongoing rehabilitation and expansion. Jurara irrigation site in Kwame local government area is one of the many sites that rice farmers are doing what they know better. Hundreds of hectares of rice farms are at different stages of growth. It's few among, among of our farmers cultivating largest area. But after this intervention of refund special forager, you will see the farmer who is cultivating about two to three, five hectares. So this time around, he will be able to cultivate like 20, 30, 40 and above hectares. While the people of Gombe State await the takeoff of the Dad in Kua hydroelectricity project, irrigation farmers continue to make use of the opportunities provided by the dam. Nafisa Umar Garba, NTA News. And now, Speaker House of Representatives Femi Bajabi Amila says investigating alleged $2.4 billion revenue last through an alleged illegal sale of 48 million barrels of crude oil is a purely constitutional duty and not an attempt to witch hunt anyone. This was at the commencement of the investigation into the allegations. National Assembly correspondent Dayo Ogunsala reports. The 1999 Constitution has amended and standing orders empowered the House of Representatives to embark on this type of investigation. The motive is to determine the veracity or otherwise of the Mungo's amount alleged to have been lost from the sales of 48 million barrels of the nation's crude in China. While it is imperative to highlight that these are unverified allegations, the honors is on the House of Representatives as a responsible house of the Nigerian people to carry out a thorough investigation to ascertain the veracity or otherwise. The investigative hearing, therefore, is intended to give stakeholders an opportunity to shed more light on their submissions as well as give Nigerians who might have valuable information and insights which could illuminate our investigations. The whole Testifying Honda Hood, a commissioner from Code of Conduct Bureau, alleged discrepancies in the amount of money acknowledged by the CBN as proceed from the sale of crude between 2011 and 2014. The crude oil sold in the global destination, where the money went to, the account it was paid into. This is 41 country. This book, I am going to give it to you to study it, and look into it in-depthly so that you will not know what is going on in Nigeria. The committee, however, invited Minister of Finance, the Attorney General of the Federation, and Secretary to the Government of the Federation for further briefing 
into the operation of the whistleblower policy. From the National Assembly, Dayo Gunshola. Steel on energy matters, oil prices edged up on Wednesday as the market waited for U.S. inflation data later in the day that will likely influence the Federal Reserve's policy on future interest rate hikes. Reuters reports that Brent could gain 14 cents to $85.74 a barrel, while U.S. Wex Texas Intermediate rose 6 cents to $81.59 a barrel. Prices had risen about 2% on Tuesday amid optimism that the U.S. Federal Reserve is getting closer to ending its cycle of interest rate hikes and making dollar-priced oil cheaper for buyers holding other currencies. Let's now take a trip to the commodities market. And a look at the market down at home, equities closed in red. It is a continuous run on the BS as the old share index declined to 51,953.41 a basis point as equities capitalization fell to 28.3 trillion naira. A total of 255 million securities valued at 1.7 billion naira were traded in 3,890 deals. Transcap, Fidelity, and UBA were the most traded stocks in terms of volume at the end of this session. Let's now see what the stocks look like on the global market with Bossa de Ebo. Investors will be digesting the International Monetary Fund's latest global growth report released Tuesday, which included its weakest medium-term growth forecast for more than 30 years. European markets were mixed Wednesday as investors await key inflation data from the U.S. set for release later in the day. That data will likely determine the U.S. Federal Reserve's part in its tightening cycle. DAX rose 0.34%, FTSE 0.70% and KEK 40 0.45%. Markets in Asia were mostly higher as investors also focused on the key U.S. inflation data set for release in the day. The Nikkei appreciated by 0.57% across 28,082.70, Shanghai Composite by 0.41%, while the Hang Seng Index dipped 0.86% at 20,309.86. Stock futures in the U.S. rose slightly Wednesday as investors turned their focus to March's highly anticipated inflation report. Futures tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 95 points or 0.28 percent. S&P 500 futures gained 0.24 percent and the Nasdaq 100 futures also advanced 0.16 percent. Most Africa stocks closed mostly bearish, like the South Africa's JSE Africa Top 40, Tunisia's Tunidex and Namibia's Overall Index, while other stocks remained muted. Bossede Able, Business Express. Thank you, Bossede. And uh, Naira gains as much as 701 Naira to a dollar. The Naira rose to its highest level against the dollar since December 2022 on Wednesday as demands for the dollar backed a stable coin. A decline on Binance's uh, to P2P market. Let's now see how much the Naira is exchanging for other currencies at the Central Bank of Nigeria official rate.
Thank you. Do join us again on Thursday at 9.30 a.m. for another package. I am Benny Adams saying enjoy the rest of your day.